telling you. Chocolate's good for you. Very good for you. We can go ahead and get started a little bit early. I'm going to, uh, we have obviously quite a few people that need prayer. And uh, I want to go over some church news real quick. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, soul winning uh, yielded uh, two salvations. Amen to that. And um, at the same time we're doing that, the, the uh, party was down uh, in Gilbert getting signatures, which uh, sounds like it went well. Uh, they didn't get everybody they wanted to come out to do it, but uh, they'll be at it every Saturday moving forward. Um, and potluck. Again, I'm smoking a whole turkey, so... I might make uh, some cornbread stuffing too, but uh, y'all can bring whatever you want. It'll be on uh, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, which I believe is the 28th, if I remember correctly. So, looking forward to that. In fact, you know, Thanksgiving is arguably one of my favorite holidays. And it's so, for most of the world, it's, it's just, you know obscure little thing that happens in, at the end of November. Um, Hell Night tonight is more popular than Halloween, hands down, Christmas and so on. But Thanksgiving means a lot to me because, well, quite frankly, I have a lot to be grateful for, and I think we all do. Um, and if we keep that at the forefront of our mind, especially our own salvations, uh, keep that thank you train going. Uh, so I emphasize that uh, it's a great and very important day to just give thanks to our Lord. So I, I hope that uh, you take it as seriously as I do. Um, an interesting thing I saw in the news this morning, uh, exorcisms are on the rise. I mean, possessions are on the rise as well. I mean, but they're blaming COVID for it. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I'm dead serious. That's exactly what the article said. Uh, U.S. Patriots are warning the cartels that are tending to come across the border in Texas, and they rightfully so. Um, they will. There'll be a bloodbath for sure. The cartels are saying they're coming, and uh, Patriots are down there already. The uh, uh, militia is there to uh, protect the great state of Texas. Uh, they have no idea what they're in store for because, well. We've seen our Patriots here. They're they're they they're on to the teeth. Remember when we went to uh, that uh, event uh, in downtown? Um, these guys uh, and gals are very serious about their duty as militia. Uh, the other interesting thing I saw in the news, which we were talking about a little bit this morning, Jim Caviezel is talking about running for president. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with who he is. He uh, played Jesus in the Passion of Christ. Um, I have nothing bad to say about that, but, you know, uh, he seems like a decent fella. Uh, and uh, his um, his attitude and, and his morality is, is very admirable. I've seen him speak on a couple of subjects. So, uh, we do have some people to pray for, so let's go ahead and get into our prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for that wonderful day yesterday to see that, that young couple led to, to you, Lord. What a wonderful moment it was to be a part of that. And we know that salvation is yours alone, and I am grateful to be the vessel and bring the word to them. Two more people who will be in heaven, and you only know how many others will be led to, to you through them as well. Lord, we, we pray for... Brother Richard, you see, suffering greatly uh, after two strokes and uh, uh, the uh, infection and, and uh, the, the constant falling. We pray that uh, he is restored and his, his mind and heart are at peace, knowing that you are in complete control of his life. And bless his, his uh, very existence with uh, health and vitality and joy. Uh, bring uh, your joy upon him. He needs it greatly at this time. 
as he is struggling with uh, his, his own uh, feelings, uh, during, going through these, these uh, struggles at the, the hospital. So we ask that you bless him greatly. Lord, we continue to pray for Brother Ben up in Canada, that he's hedged and protected from all the craziness that's going on up in, in that country. Uh, we pray for my brother Derek, who's uh, gone through both uh, vaccinations. Uh, we pray that uh, he is not going to uh, incumbent that the, uh, any illness as a result of the vaccination or, or worse. We pray for his son, that uh, he returns and uh, gets his head straight and, and understands uh, who you are, Lord, first and foremost. Uh, we pray for my mother, that she is healed. She's very excited about doing the work for you, Lord, and, and she's blessed by uh, just being there. She's very grateful. Lord, we uh, pray for Walter. His, his interest is uh, returning, and uh, I'm grateful that uh, he has got a spark to, to do the work for you, Lord. Lord, we uh, continue to pray for this house. We have uh, a new life that we are taking care of with wonderful serenity. We pray that she grows up to be a, a mighty woman for you, Lord, and, and uh, learns greatly from uh, her, my wife that she, she becomes a great woman through her. Lord, uh, we pray for uh, my, my son, keep him hedged, and, and hopefully uh, he sees the sermon later and learns quite a bit about the, the flood and the ark. Uh, we pray for Sister Christine and, and uh, Sister Terry, as uh, they're home, hopefully watching now. We pray that the, the message blesses them and they are uh, full of your joy and your, your grace. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for all the things that you've done for us. We are incredibly grateful for the, the blessings and the providence upon us, and the wisdom that you give us. Lord, we, we cannot thank you enough. And we look forward to, to spending time just in praise and adoration of you and, and blessing your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A little bit longer of a prayer than usual, but there's a lot of folks that we had to pray for. And uh, I uh, sincerely uh, hope that... Uh, and I'm sure I've probably missed a few that I, I should have prayed for, but know that you're in my heart and I love you dearly. Um, okay, so we're going to do chapter 8 and 9 today. Uh, we learned quite a bit about the, the flood and the fascinating aspect of that water above the firmament. Uh, the, when ice becomes very, very cold, it becomes polarized which explains why we had the Ice Age, uh, which really wasn't an age, it was just a short period of time, actually. But it explains why there was so much ice on the North and South Pole. Fascinating stuff. And the fact that the Lord was with them in the ark, that was awesome. Uh, it wasn't a localized flood. And uh, as we stated it, um, it was seven months and 17 days that the ark sat upon Mount Ararat. Uh, after 10 months, the mountain, mountains uh, would have been seen. 40 days after landing, Noah opened the window. Noah was 601 in one month when he left the ark. And this is where we start in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Now, first of all, God's not forgetful. When he says he remembered Noah, it doesn't mean that he was forgetful. He, what it means is simply that he kept him on his mind. Okay? So he's, he kept him on his mind. And when we're talking about the word assuage, some of you might not be aware of what it means. It just means that the water was calm. So when the waters from underneath the earth came out and the waters from the uh, above the firmament came down, there was turbulent waters, okay? The, the, the tectonic plates were shifting, so the waters were very turbulent and probably tossing the ark to and fro. But God calmed the waters as, as he does. And uh, verse, I'm going to do 2 through 22 here. And the fountains also the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. 
And the ark rested in the uh, seventh month of the seventh day of the month upon the mountain of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month of the first day of the month were the tops of the mountain seen. And it came to pass at the end of the forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark and with, which he had made. And he sent forth a raven which, uh, which went forth to, to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him and to, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the, the ground. And the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And then he put forth his hand and took her and, and pulled her into, in, in, unto, unto him, unto the ark. <clears throat> And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf uh, plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days, and sent forth the dove, and returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass that the six hundred and first year, uh, the first month, the first day of the month, and the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, for all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may be breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. And, he sent forth Noah, <clears throat> and Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds, and forth out of the ark. The ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. <clears throat> and the Lord smelled the sweet savor. <clears throat> God loves barbecue, and so do I. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and, and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So now we have seasons. What has happened because of the flood, the uh, temperate climate has completely changed. That perfect environment of the earth has changed. That means that so is every living thing. Every living thing is going to be reacting towards the seasons. Uh, and again, I think it's absolutely fascinating that the Lord loves the smell of a good barbecue. Just being honest. So do I. There's, now, I'm going to share with you some fascinating stuff here. There's a sign at where the ark lays today. The sign says, Kui Na, I believe that, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's Persian for Noah's Mountain. In September of 1960, 27-year-old Ron Wyatt, along with thousands of other people, read an article in Life magazine about a strange boat-shaped formation in the mountains of Ararat while routinely examining uh, aerial photos of this country. A Turkish army captain suddenly uh, gaped at the, the picture uh, there on a mountain 20 miles south of Mount Ararat, the biblical landfill of Noah's Ark. <clears throat> it was a boat shaped form about 500 feet long. Interesting. And we know that the, uh, the ark was about 450 feet. But what happens when it settles for a while? It gets splayed out, right? And there's more explanations to that why it's, it's 500 feet as well. The captain passed on the word. Soon the explanation, uh, expedition included American scientists were set on site. Uh, there was no Hebrew cubit in existence during Moses' time. We talked about this. 
uh, and as well as we're going to decide as to what the cubit looks like for, for men who might have been uh, considerably larger. So, uh, Life Magazine's uh, article uh, was compelling. Uh, after all, 300 royal Egyptian cubits uh, equals 515 feet, not 450 as the ark should be. Some of these things were found by Wyatt in 1977 archaeological study were uh, anchor stones. The ark needed anchor stones. Big, huge anchor stones. Otherwise, the ark would have been tossed to and fro more than uh, that he wanted. Um, and what's interesting about the anchor stones is that there were eight crosses carved into it wow. that they found. Fascinating. Two, four, six, eight. Noah, yep. Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. Mm -hmm. That makes eight. <clears throat> well, why do they think of crosses? Interesting. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Later, metal detectors were brought in. Uh, oh, I almost forgot. Let's back up a little bit. They were found structures built in the area out of stone. Uh, some of them uh, could have been houses and fences. In that property, if you will, there were tombstones or grave markers which they believe was uh, Noah's wife. Uh, later metal detectors were brought in. There was a metal detector uh, uh, they found uh, in the ark in Mount Dararat, and uh, it's been determined that the metal was used for tools. Now the, the country of Turkey doesn't like metal detectors, so the specimens were taken by the Turkish government. Dating the material that they found about well, just over 4,000 years ago. Hmm. Kind of coincides with scripture, doesn't it? Fascinating trail that formed the top of Mount Ararat to the structure uh, where it resides uh, as if the ship slid down through the mud. Makes sense to me. When we just saw here the waters assuage, well, he was on top of Mount Ararat, but the mud, that's a big ship, and should have slid down. So, <clears throat> at some point, it was covered in lava, and it created a time capsule preserving it. The wood that the ship was made out of became petrified. Fascinating. Either way uh, you choose, the, the fact that the ark was covered by lava does not in any way means that it had been burned up. In fact, the deck seemed to be uniformly collapsed, indicates that it was covered rapidly, which would have cut off the oxygen supply. And we do have specimens which display some burning but it seems to be very limited extent. <clears throat> the ark revealed when lava deteriorated, the lava covered the ark and sealed it airtight capsule. So why is it now visible? Why is it that it's still encased in lava? Because lava de deteriorates and breaks down over time into the fertile soil. The soil was uh, developed from uh, decomposing of lava, cinders and ashes, exceptionally rich uh, uh, potash lime and phosphates. Many uh, districts of the world with high ar ar agricultural population owe the richness of their land to volcanic material. It comes from, uh, I guess, the uh, IBID page 173. <clears throat> the color difference of the petrified ribs. The internal structure members are in such a better state simply because they have not been exposed to the elements. On the east side of the ark is a section in which the rib timbers are exposed, but not completely fallen away and left holes where they once were. However, these are fractured, having suffered from frost wedging, and was a section that Ron and Richard performed a mini excavation in which the ribs were able to be seen due to the color difference, even though the ribs are in fragmented state. They are still held in place in the soil, probably due to their angle and also some divine assistance, amen to that. The, the found what appears to be a bilge keel, and only people that uh, have been on ships or seamen would know what a bilge keel is. So your bilge keel uh, is the fin on the bottom boat, right? So that it, the boat doesn't go like this, that long, you ever seen the sailboat? Okay, on the bottom the sailboat there's a long uh, structure underneath it. It's called a bilge keel. Uh, 
and to keep the, the ship from capsizing during turbulent waves. There was also a manganese ballast. They found that too. How cool. The discovery of titanium in, in, in rivet was also found as a special interest. The advantage of titanium as a metal is tremendous strength and lightweight and resistance to corrosion. All the analysis performed on the rivet found to, to contain iron, aluminum, manganese, uh, vandium, and chromium. These are the elements are known today uh, uh, to be the major uh, 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 allowing agents added to titanium. Here's another fascinating thing. Philidae hairs found. Philidae hairs are, are, are feline hairs. They don't know what kind, but uh, they were found inside the ark. All of this you can find at whyitsmuseum.com. So the ark is there. And it has a lot of fascinating stuff to, to look at. And we praise the Lord that it's there. And the evidence of uh, a real flood is there. And I was listening to uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ken Hoven talk about the Grand Canyon. And that was likely formed in a period of two weeks or less. And as uh, the waters assuage and you have a lake up there, and whatever was preventing the lake uh, from breaking, it overflowed. And consequently, we have what's now called the Grand Canyon here in Arizona. And uh, despite uh, the, uh, <clears throat> these people that don't like God, uh, who claim that it's billions and billions and billions of years old, uh, the evidence shows otherwise. Fascinating stuff. And you see, throughout the world, uh, Trees petrified, standing straight up, which means that they were covered very quickly. Amazing, absolutely amazing stuff. Um, so we're going to get into chapter 9 here. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. The first ordinance to be fruitful, an ordinance that has never changed. It's never changed. Uh, to replenish the earth simply means to fill it, not to refill it. So the, the, the language that's used in the King James Bible is, again, very specific. And the, the language that we speak today has been altered and changed and muddled and oftentimes watered down. So, being fruitful is something that every uh, Bible-believing Christian should be. Uh, of course, being married uh, would be very important. And those who are married to the Lord, they ought to be fruitful in leading people to the Lord in that regard. So we have both physical and spiritual fruitfulness. So we're going to go from 2 to 29 here. We close out this chapter. And uh, we're going to discuss some things after that. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. So before the flood, everything lived in symbiosis because they were all herbivores. You know, the animals weren't afraid of man because they weren't hunting them. Okay? Now things have changed. And upon every fowl of the air, and upon all the move upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea in, into your hand are, are they delivered. Every morning, every moving thing that it liveth shall be meat for you. Even as a green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your, your lives will I require, at that hand of every beast will I require, and at the hand of the man, and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall be his blood be shed, for in the image of God made man. So he's now he's telling us that we should be killing each other, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, it's not a, uh, it, it listed as a commandment as of yet in, in that context, but uh, the reality is that he doesn't want uh, people to be killing each other, and he's offering punishment as a result of. And again, the image of God, is something I preached on before, uh, is something to have a great deal of reverence for. So when we're discussing things such as today, people covering their faces, or tattoos and piercings. These are things that obviously God is frowning upon because the image of God is sacred. 
So that's uh, something that you, could, you can gather here when he said, Here for in men into God made, men, made he men. And you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and his sons with him, saying, And I behold, I establish my covenant with you. Now, covenant, incidentally, that's a word that is interchangeable with testament. So we have Old and New Testament, and the term also uh, is interchangeable with covenant. So we have the Old Covenant and New Covenant. <clears throat> and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the fowl and the cattle, and of every beast of the earth, with you from all that go out of the ark, and every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood, neither shall there be any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is which a token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. And I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token, be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And of course, that's uh, a image that's been hijacked today, um, sadly. The abomination uh, is uh, utilizing it for their purposes, in each color representing some type of abomination. And we as Christians uh, have the right to revere the bow as what it is, the promise of God, not as something filthy. <clears throat> and again it passed, when I bring a cloud over the, the earth, and the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my, uh, my covenant. Okay. Again, using the term remember doesn't mean that God's forgetful. It's just that he's keeping it at the forefront of his mind. Okay. <clears throat> Which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the, the cloud, and I will look upon it, and, and I will remember the every everlasting covenant between God and every living creature, and all the flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah, they went forth, uh, uh, forth of the ark, where Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham and, and, is, and Ham is the father of Canaan, and there are the sons of Noah, and of them was the, uh, was the whole earth uh, overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, which means he, he started to farm. And he planted a vineyard and drank the wine that was, and was drunken. And he was uncovered within a tent. And Ham, and the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon uh, both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. They deliberately did not look. And Noah awake from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, and the servants of servants shall be he, he be unto his brethren. And he, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge in Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all of the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Okay. A couple of things here that we need to discuss. First, we need to see that the first time someone consumed in excess. Okay. Well, in the case of Noah, uh, this is the first time that alcohol was introduced, so excess... Um, could have been very little. Um, it's not just tequila that makes people's clothes come off. Obviously, the wine does it as well. Anything in excess is bad. Okay? Wine is a mocker and a strong drink is raging. Uh, the deceived part of that verse in, in, uh, in Proverbs uh, means that some people think they can handle their liquor. Okay? Uh, oftentimes they become intoxicated. Paul speaks about the drunkard in, in 1 Corinthians 5.11 and 1 Thessalonians 5.11 uh, he encourages us to be sober. In Ephesians 5.18 Paul says not to be drunk with wine. Now I did a sermon I encourage you to uh, watch that when you get a chance 
The sermon is titled, Behold, a, a man, a glutton, and a wine-bibber. And that sermon is to dispel the myth that many of my Baptist brothers have, and consumption is forbidden. Consumption is not forbidden. Um, that sermon will clarify that for you, because Jesus Christ was drinking wine. The apostles were drinking wine. They weren't drinking grape juice. Okay? That's just foolishness. The other subject I want to cover here uh, is the uncovered Noah. Now, uh, we are a New Testament church, but keep in mind uh, what Paul says here uh, in Galatians 3, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, schoolmaster, we need to understand what that word means. Okay? It is someone who instructs or leads. So what is he saying about the law? It instructs or leads us, right? <clears throat> Having said that, what has changed from the Old Testament to the New? Incidentally, in Testament, again, as I stated to you earlier, what means covenant. Many will play the race card with the Old and New Testament. Old is for the Jews and New Testament is for the Christians. I simply don't believe that. In fact, in Romans 2 and Galatians 3, should dispel that concept because uh, we are the seed of Christ and heirs according to the promise. We still abide by his commandments. And uh, we, when we don't, his promise to us is to scourge us as children, right? If we don't obey God, well, he's going to correct us. Colossians 2 and 3 give us clear clarity what exactly was changed from the Old Testament to the New, okay? Blotting out, the hand, uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So our sin debt was nailed to the cross. Okay? So you are no longer uh, indebted in that way because Christ took your debt. He atoned for your debt. Christ became our Sabbath. We rest in him. We worship daily. We have been meeting on the first day of the week since Antioch. This is not a Roman Catholic conspiracy. A, a lot of the people I've known over the years have, have uh, fallen into this, this uh, Judaizing Seventh-day Adventist malarkey. I grew up in a church like that. It's a farce. Uh, we do not have to observe Seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, and it's... And it, it, what ends up happening is every single time they become Judaizers. What that means is that they are so enthralled by uh, the rituals and traditions of Judaism that they lost sight of Christ. <clears throat> we can eat all things, as the Bible clearly has said. We have no dietary restrictions. That has uh, always been the case. Christ fulfilled most of the, uh, the holy days. So the high holy days, there's seven high holy days in the Old Testament. Okay? And Christ fulfilled them. So the observance of them is not, not of any consequence. We don't have to, to observe the, these uh, high holy days. Now the Feast of Trumpets hasn't occurred or the tabernacle yet to come. So the trumpets we're talking about is when Christ returns. That's, this is what the Feast of Trumpets is supposed to represent. And the tabernacle is when we are home with him. Remember Christ said that I have mansions for you, right? That's the tabernacle. That's, that's the feast of the, with the, our Lord. Now, in, 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 all that encompasses the return, wrath, and judgment, eternal reign of Christ. <clears throat> Having said that, Leviticus 18, verses 7 through 17, I want to take you there in regards to what uh, just happened with Noah and his nakedness. This is, holds true for us today. It has not changed. We can observe much of Levitical law in obedience unto the Lord. And we see the benefit of it. So, Levit Leviticus chapter 18, I'll go ahead and read that for you. And it'll make sense when I read it. Verse 7 through 17 here. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. Shem and Japheth walked backward into the tent to cover their father. He did not look upon his nakedness. She is thy mother, <clears throat> thou shalt not uncover her nakedness, the nakedness of thy father's wife shall not thou uncover, 
It is thy father's naked. Uh, it, it is thy father's naked. So the wife's nakedness belongs to the father. So, an example would be: I am the only one that can look on my on my wife naked. No one else can. Um, the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, whether she is be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness shalt, thou shalt not uncover. <clears throat> Nakedness of thy son's daughter and of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness, the nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father. She is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near woman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter in the law. Daughter-in-law, she is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness, her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover her, her nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. I mean, again, she belongs to uh, him, and he's the only one that can look upon her. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman, it is her nakedness. So the bottom line is people looking upon naked people is not permitted unless you are married. Okay? Uh, and nakedness for us uh, is, well, we have a more clear understanding of modesty than the world does. So for men, we ought not to take our shirts off. Exposing ourselves at the upper portion of our torso makes us naked. Okay? It's no different than a woman. No different. So, uh, these days, <laughs> you'll see naked men on the street all the time. Okay? Even worse, they have their backsides hanging out. And women, same thing. They just, there's no modesty anymore. So looking upon people's nakedness is forbidden, however, and again, men can look upon their wives and vice versa. Um, but in this instance, what happened? Ham looked upon his father. And he celebrated it. He was, he's calling in his brothers, come here, look. That's a very queer thing and unnatural. Men do not look upon other men in that regard. You just you, Normal men don't do it. Many have preached on this subject and Ham's actions were homosexual intense. I would agree. I don't want to look at any man's business. It's just disgusting. Now, being a power lifter most of my life, I've been in various gyms, okay? Uh, I can tell you there is no modesty in a locker room. The natural reaction is to be uncomfortable or repulsed by the nakedness of another man. It's just a fact. And chapter 10 of Genesis is the uh, Toledot 4. Um, and I'm going to go over a couple of quick things with you regarding that. So we understand that what, that's what's happened. I mean, you got... Uh, Ham doing something very queer. Now, tell about four. There's some fun stuff here. Verses one through three. Now these are the generations of sons of Noah, uh, Noah Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and, and unto them were the sons born after the flood. And the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, and Ish. Ashkenaz, and Ripeth, and Togermah. Okay, now, I want to share with you fun stuff here, because there are things that you don't know. You've got a lot of lineage here, people that they're talking about. The Gomerites, or the Gomerines, were later called Galatians by the Greeks, which today settled England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. So, those of us who are Scot, these are our ancestors. Uh, verses 4 and 5. And the sons of Javan and Elisha and, and Tarshish, uh, Kittim and Dodanim, by the, the, were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, 
everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Now, the isles doesn't mean islands, however, uh, not uh, something as small because the nations of Japheth uh, could not become great if they were small. Those, those islands in perspective. So, what we're looking at is a Mediterranean area. Okay? So, what we're seeing is places like Italy and Greece. This is where they're at. Alright? Verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizra, and, and Foot, and, and Canaan. Ham's lineage settled Syrian country, Cush being Arabia. Later, the people uh, were Ethiopian or Phoenician. And Mizram would be Egypt, and Foot would be the Futines of Libya. Verses 7 through 10. And the sons of Cush and Seba and, and Habiah and, and Sabda and Ramah and Shetacha and the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod and be, be, began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Erech, Erech and Akkad and Kala in the land of Shinar. Okay, Nimrod, the mighty warrior whose name actually means rebellious. The city of Babel later becomes Babylon, and the roots of their mighty kingdom. In our modern terms, it is a globalist regime. Understanding what Babel means uh, to us today uh, is globalist mentality. A great power. Unlimited power which corrupts. Verse 11. And on the land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Reboth uh, and Kelah. Nineveh was a beautiful city. Of course, later when we get into Jonah, you know, you're going to find out that Jonah was uh, a little uh, racist, if you would, because he didn't want uh, to help the people of Nineveh, the Ninevites. And God put him in the belly of the fish. Uh, verses 12 through 18. And Rezan between Nineveh and Kalah, in the names of the great city, and Mizram begat Ludim, and Anaim, and Lehibim, and Neptunim, and Peruthim, and Chalcehim, out of whom came Philistim, and Captorim, and the Canaan begat Serum, and the firstborn of Heth. And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gargasite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the lots of ites, 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 ites. Okay. Um, incidentally, uh, the ites, most of these people were bad. Anytime you see the ites in the Bible, uh, they were generally bad people. A lot of them were giants. And they became very uh, tyrannical because they, being so massive, they were. Uh, guess you would use the term bullies. Verse 19 here, uh, it says, The border of you know, the Canaanites was Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza, as thou goest unto the Sodom and Gomorrah and Abdama and Zeboam, even unto Lasha. Now, these people were later called the Philistines. And we, that's where we get our giant Goliath from, right? Uh, verse 21, and Shem also the father of the children of uh, Eber, and the brother of Japheth, and the elder, even him, and children were born. Uh, Shem's line became the Hebrews. Um, verse 22 through the end of the chapter. Okay? And the children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Aphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash, and Aphaxad begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber. And Eber was born into two sons. Uh, the name was uh, Peleg. And the days was the earth divided, and, and his brother named Jokan. And Jokan begot Almarad, and Chalep, and Hazar, Zambet, and Jarah, and Horam, and Ozil, and Dika, and Obal, and Abedel, Abbim, Mayal, and Sheba, and Ophor, and Havilah, and Jobah, and all these were the sons of Joktan. And they dwelt from Misha, and the Goest, unto Safar, in the mountain of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after these families, after their tongues, and their lands, the nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, and their generations in their nations, 
and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So this is the way God wants it. God wants there to be nations because when you get everybody together like that, problems start happening. As we already know what happens with Babylon. We'll be getting into that later. So that is the end of our, our uh, genealogy for chapter 10. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the wisdom of your word. Thank you for some of these interesting little uh, pieces of information to give us a clarity of how things uh, began in the uh, post-flood era. Uh, we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters that are not here today uh, and their, their healing and their wellness. And I pray that the message is received by them clearly and we love them greatly. We pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. I got a question. Okay, and I will have an answer. Well,